Good evening. Uh, my name is Darren Reesberg. I'm the executive director uh, at the Institute of Politics, and on behalf of uh, our institute director, David Axelrod, and the rest of the Institute of Politics team, uh, I want to thank you for joining us here uh, at the beautiful Logan Center for the Arts uh, for this exciting uh, event, a conversation with David Axelrod. Um, so as many of you know, the Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan extracurricular program here at University of Chicago, and its mission, our mission, is to uh, to, to provide uh, some uh, additional support to the uh, incredible and unparalleled academic curriculum here at UChicago and instill and nurture in our students a passion for politics and public service. And we'll do that in a number of ways. Uh, we will have a wide-ranging speaker series uh, where we'll have panel discussions and lectures on issues related to politics, public service, and the media. Uh, a uh, visiting fellows program where we'll have practitioners, uh, former elected officials, political operatives, political journalists, policy makers who will come to Hyde Park for a defined period of time and among other things lead a weekly discussion group uh, for college students and others here at the university to attend. Uh, and we'll have a robust and paid internship program both during the calendar, uh, the academic calendar, as well as, as over the summer. Um, in addition to, uh, to those programs, um, we will have, uh, you know, our focus on our students, uh, but we want to think, think big. We want uh, the Institute of Politics to be a destination, uh, if not the destination, for politicians and policymakers uh, to come and convene, debate, and resolve the issues of the day and the issues of the future. And all of this programming will be done uh, with the input and guidance of, of our students. Uh, we have a student advisory council, all of whom are here tonight and help produce this event. Um, and it will all be centered out of our new digs over on 5707 South Woodlawn Avenue, uh, which will be a hub uh, for political activity and discourse on campus. Uh, we uh, uh, are expecting that, that house to open January 1st, uh, and we would welcome you to, to come by when it does. Um, so tonight, uh, David Axelrod will be interviewed by our Deputy Director of Programming, uh, the incredibly talented Steve Edwards. And they'll talk a bit more about uh, some of what we've done at the Institute of Politics, um, and more importantly, uh, what we will be doing going forward. And they'll probably talk a bit about that campaign and, and election. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, you know, uh, this probably goes Without saying, uh, you know, we have as a fundamental value here at the University of Chicago robust but civil discourse, so we just ask you support that value uh, both during uh, uh, the conversation here as well as during the question and answers uh, that, that follow. Um, this has been a, a long and much anticipated event uh, for the university, for uh, the Institute of Politics staff, our team, uh, of course for, for you all, the students. Um, but for David as well, um, it's been no secret ever since the Institute of Politics was launched back in January uh, that uh, David was incredibly and remains incredibly excited uh, uh, for this next chapter in his illustrious uh, career. And, and I've had an opportunity over the past six months or so to, to get a chance to, to see that firsthand. I saw that uh, when inexplicably during uh, you know, his leading of a presidential campaign, he would take the time to uh, actually meet and discuss his vision for the Institute with an enthusiasm that was absolutely contagious. I saw that and the gleam in his eye when he came down and, and met with students on various occasions over the course of the last six months. I saw that when we met and he got a call from, from the president and said, you know, Mr. President, this is just going to have to wait. Um, <laughs> meeting with Darren Reesberg to talk about the Institute of Politics. And uh, so that, that didn't happen, but <laughs> I, given how excited David is, I kind of thought it could have. Um, and so, um, so let, me, let me just uh, close by uh, first thanking the university, uh, President Zimmer, David Green, and the rest of the leadership for all of your support uh, for the Institute, which has been uh, instrumental. Um, and uh, one of those key university leaders uh, is the dean of the, of the college, Dean John uh, Boyer. 
as, as, as you all know, uh, Dean Boyer has been dean of the college since 1992, um, and uh, due to his tremendous vision, uh, he um, was just reappointed to an unprecedented fifth term uh, as, as dean. Uh, you know, under his, his uh, tremendous leadership, um, you know, the college has become uh, one of the most welcoming, uh, rewarding college experiences in the world. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's Dean Boyer's partnership and the partnership of those on his team uh, that exemplify uh, what we have here at the, uh, at the university and what will allow the Institute of Politics to soar, uh, not just here on campus, uh, but beyond. So uh, I'd like uh, you to, to uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dean Boyer uh, here, who will formally introduce uh, David Axelrod. Thank you. It's uh, the the stories about the calls from the White House are are uh, both uh, illuminating and um, and I have to say somewhat plausible, and um, uh, but I think it's we're all delighted that the election is over. Um, I um, it's my honor to introduce David uh, Axelrod this evening. David is a um, an alum of the college. He's uh, he graduated in, in 1976. He went to um, work as a um, Cub reporter at the, uh, at the Tribune, and uh, by the, I think the age of 26, 27, was uh, already a, an important figure. He became the uh, chief of the City Hall Bureau, which is a fairly important uh, position in, in, in any person's life, much less someone 27 years old. Um, he um, uh, met a young, uh, an up-and-coming um, uh, community organizer by the name of Barack Obama in 1992, but. Uh, some time passed, and, and by 2004, uh, he was involved with uh, Obama's campaign uh, for the for the Senate. He helped uh, Barack Obama defeat six other candidates in the primary, and then to win the general election in a landslide. Um, after the um, historic uh, 2008 campaign, David went to work in the White House as a senior advisor to the president, where he served until February of 2011. Um, he, uh, as Darren mentioned, been very active in the current campaign as a senior strategist for the um, for President Obama. And all, 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 while doing all of this, he's run his own consulting firm, um, managing media and communication strategy for over 150 other people. Uh, so there are an awful lot of successful, many more successful than unsuccessful candidates who owe a great deal to David Axelrod's prescience and, and street smarts and, um, and brilliance in, um, in, uh, in the practice of politics. Um, in January of 2013, David will start as the inaugural director of our New Institute of Politics, and uh, we're really delighted that he and his team are going to be joining our um, our community. When I think of David's really remarkable career and the extraordinary impact that he's had in public service over the last 30 years using his University of Chicago education, I recall something that uh, Robert Kennedy once said to the effect that the future is not a gift, it's an achievement. It's an achievement that has to be achieved every day. I think David rightly understands that our nation needs strong, credible, and skillful political leaders of both parties from all ideological and political backgrounds to create and to protect that future, not to take that future for granted. David's resoluteness, resoluteness in action is only exceeded by his dedication to fundamental principle. So I hope you will join me in welcoming David Axelrod home, home to his first intellectual home, to the University of Chicago. Thank you. So I got to say that one of the best things about sitting here across from you having this conversation tonight is uh, for all of us that have been part of the Institute staff, we have been, I think, wondering what you've been thinking, what this experience has been like for you over the last you know, year and a half, two years. And so tonight, we get a chance, as with everybody <laughs> here, to hear for the first time what this campaign and your reaction has been. So well, welcome. It's, thank you very much. For, also, I want to thank uh, Dean Boyer for the incredible support the university has given the Institute of Politics, and, and including uh, making it possible for us to 
to hire such extraordinary people as Steve Edwards so, and Darren Reesberg and all the others who are working on this. So I'm very Thank thankful you. for that. Thank you. And uh, as you've been wondering what I've been doing, I've been wondering what you guys have been doing. <laughs> exactly. So we can, we've got to catch up. Exactly, exactly. Uh, well, let's, let's jump to, I think, the, the big question that Republicans are wondering who are disappointed by this outcome, the Democrats are wondering who are elated by this outcome, and that is, given the conventional wisdom around this campaign, you know, a president's <coughs> approval ratings that were barely above 50%, often nipping below it, uh, the unemployment rate around 8%, uh, GDP growth stuck at around 2%. The conventional wisdom was that this president uh, should not be reelected if you were to play along with what people were saying, say, a year ago. As you take a look at what happened two weeks ago now, how do you assess this victory? Let me just say first that uh, I made a pretty good living in politics betting against the conventional <laughs> wisdom. And I think that uh, uh, it's a general principle of mine that the conventional wisdom is almost always wrong. And it was wrong here. Uh, it was wrong here because uh, what we often do in political, uh, in, in political circles in journalism is we look at what happened the last election or in past elections, and we think that's prescriptive for what's going to happen in the future. And we, we're in a, it's a much more dynamic process than that. Uh, and the assumption was, well, no president's ever been elected other than Franklin Roosevelt with unemployment higher than 7.2%. 7 but no president other than Franklin Roosevelt has ever inherited a situation as dire as the one as Barack uh, Obama walked into. And the American people understood that. And, you know, we did probably four or five hundred focus groups during the course of uh, the last few years. Four or five hundred? Well, I, I'm just, that's a guess. Yeah. Uh, and it's probably wrong, but it, uh, <laughs> now that I think about it, but, uh, but, a lot but of probably groups. hundreds, certainly several hundred uh, focus groups. The, the next time we meet, I will have the, the exact <laughs> number, but we've, we spoke to, to, to thousands and thousands of people in a very intimate way, and um, invariably people would say, you know, we're not happy where things are at, and we were talking to swing voters, voters who could vote potentially for us or against us, not people who are all for us or all against us. And in, invariably they would say, things aren't where we like them, but they were terrible when he got there, and you know, maybe we should give him a little bit more of a chance. That was always uh, the case. So this 7.2% benchmark uh, never meant anything. But I will tell you, Steve, that the day after that uh, catastrophic midterm election, the, the shellacking as the president <laughs> called it, um, I said to him, you know, uh, I really think the seeds of your reelection were planted yesterday. And the reason I felt that way was because uh, the gravitational pull within the Republican Party from the right became so strong uh, in that midterm election that it was clear to me that any Republican candidate was going to have to uh, deal with those forces to become the nominee, was going to have to go through that toll booth and pay a very heavy toll. Uh, to become the nominee uh, in a party that was uh, uh, where, where, the, uh, where the gravitational pull, as I call it, was against immigration reform, was very much against choice, was against um, um, gay marriage, was against uh, a, a lot of things that were running against the demographic and social trends uh, of the country uh, and where the country was moving. And, and that proved out. Uh, you know, uh, Mitt Romney made a series of Faustian bargains in order to become the nominee of the Republican Party. In order to beat Rick Perry, he moved uh, to the right of Rick Perry on immigration. In order to beat Rick Santorum, he moved to the right of him on social issues. He took the Grover Norquist pledge uh, and did all the things that were required uh, of a potential Republican nominee. But in each of those steps, he, uh, he made it harder for him to win a, a general uh, election, and then he brought to this some strengths. Because, and you know, the other thing that I told the president four years ago was that Romney was the likely nominee because I believe in this theory of opposites that uh, whoever the incumbent is, people are always looking for the re uh, the remedy, not the replica, and that Romney would represent a stark difference from Obama, businessman, grounded, you know, not a not a not a visionary, not a orator, not a and um, 
So, so you thought he would be the nominee. Did I that did. hold throughout the entire primary process as well? Well, um, uh, I uh, had a few moments of doubt, <laughs> as I suspect he may have. But, in order, but how he got through those moments of doubt was do, to do what I said, was to move uh, to the right. Uh, and uh, with each step, I think he made himself more vulnerable. And, you know, in the, in the abstract, his profile as a businessman was a positive. Even to the final day, it was a positive. The concept of a businessman who knows how to make, uh, create jobs and so on. That was their message, and that was not a bad message. You also that, told Mike Allen of Politico that, that you didn't think the Romney campaign emphasized that enough. Well, I didn't think they emphasized who he was enough. I don't think they fleshed him out enough. I think that uh, the thing about running for president is you have to be fully dimensional. Uh, it's not like any other office. People need to know who you are. They need to feel comfortable with who you are. And so whatever message you build has to be built around uh, your biography, and it has to be uh, compelling. And uh, they, uh, the Romney campaign spent uh, at least 90% of its uh, money in the primaries on negative ads. <clears throat> Never spent time fleshing him out, uh, you know, developing a portrait of who Romney was. After he won the nomination, we expected the first thing they would do would be to do that and just create a, a stronger sense among the American people as to who he was. They never did that. Uh, and that, of course, left an opening for him to be uh, defined around uh, some of the business practices that have become uh, well known now. Uh, I want to talk more about the general election campaign and how that played out tactically and otherwise. But let's stay with the chronology for just a second. Yes. So you talked about kind of the, the, the meta narrative as you saw it, this idea that the 2010 might bode well for the president. What is happening behind the scenes in the president's reelection campaign during this time when you're looking at data? What are, you, what, what are the seeds of the strategy? Well, first of all, let me saw? make a point, and I think it's really important because the um, IOP uh, and my basic approach to politics is, is rooted in a belief that it is more than just a game of tactics and um, you know, strategies, parries and thrusts. Uh, it means something. And, uh, what was fundamental and what ultimately made the difference for us, and we can get into the particulars of it, uh, of, of aspects of why we won, but was the fact that uh, the president's fundamental message, and it was one that he ran on in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2008, um, uh, was that we need to uh, not just uh, rebuild our economy, but reclaim the security that so many Americans had lost, the economic security, that we needed to put people back to work, but we also needed an economy in which work paid. Uh, it was an essential recognition that that fundamental compact that we all thought of as the American dream had been shredded, and that there were things that we needed to do to fix that, uh, and that that was essential. And it was clear that uh, uh, Governor Romney and the other side had a much different view, which is more of a top-down uh, kind of approach that if, if, if folks at the top did well, that prosperity, their prosperity would lead to the prosperity of the country. And we just had a much different view. Our notion was that if the middle class uh, thrives, then the country itself will thrive and be stronger. So there was really something big at stake here beyond all of that. And I want to emphasize that. But uh, getting back to your question, um, you know, whether that message was resonant or not and with whom was part of what we needed to find out. And uh, we did spend a lot of time and effort on, uh, on research, talking to voters, did a long uh, ethnographic study of thousands of uh, voters to, uh, 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 to really get a sense of what, their li what was going on in their lives, what was really important to them and so on. And this fundamental concern about um, the economy and about their own economic prospects was central to, uh, to those concerns. And I, I really think that narrative was the one that played through big uh, in this race. We also, you know, getting back to my point about the primaries understood um, that, you know, our country is becoming more diverse, that every election uh, that diversity was more prominent in terms of the share of the electorate. Uh, that uh, Latino voters uh, uh, represented, that African American voters, we, we knew that um, you know women would continue to be uh, 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 vote in larger numbers than 
uh, than men, and and often in a different way. And uh, so, you know, we mapped out uh, a plan and a strategy to make the case strongly to those uh, constituencies. So while um, Governor Romney was uh, separating himself uh, in many ways from those constituencies, we were uh, working hard to develop uh, and burnish um, our support there, which was, uh, you know, strong to start with. Um, so, you know, there was an, and a, a central of that was uh, really doing a lot of um, uh, compilation of data about, about voters around the country, um, uh, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, tracking where our for supporters have been in 2008. Many of them were um, mobile and were no longer where they had lived before, finding them, getting them re-registered. Registration was a big part of it. And really identifying that vote that we needed to win and de developing an ongoing conversation with these voters so that we could mobilize them at the appropriate time. I mean, I've heard that it, it, that it included cross-referencing not only voting behavior, but, uh, you know, social activities and the kinds of, you know, what, what, the, what the kinds of films they like. There were all sorts of behavioral data that you were able to cross here to really Well, you know, we live in a time where so much, uh, so much happens on, uh, online, in the social media, and uh, including, by the way, uh, so yes, a lot of information uh, accrues there, but also um, that's how people share information. One of the interesting things that we learned was that um, that people were much more apt to accept information from friends, on, you know, on Facebook or elsewhere, Twitter, than they were, uh, you know, if we were simply as a campaign to send them information or if, uh, or information they were seeing, you know, on some broadcast. Um, so, you know, really developing those social networks was essential uh, to our strategy. I, I want to come back to the point you made about tactics being. Uh, not nearly as important as the bigger message. You know that one of the criticisms leveled at the campaign was that it was too tactical, it wasn't visionary enough. What's your response to that, that, that this, this re-election wasn't about the bigger well, picture? Well, I just hopefully. go back to what I said before. Uh, I think it was about big things. It was about how we think about this economy. Um, it was about whether um, uh, tax, tax cuts at the top we're more valuable to growing the kind of country we need and we believe in and the kind of economy we believe in than investing in things like education and research and development, uh, investing in clean energy technology, investing uh, in infrastructure and dealing with our deficits in a more balanced way. It was, uh, uh, it was about what our obligations are to each other. Um, you know, it was about big things. Those are very, very big things. I will say this, that you know, for all the critique about uh, whether uh, our campaign was about big things or not, the preoccupation of people who write about it, and I used to do that for a living, so, you know, I, I don't try and separate myself from the many or my best friends, you know, um, <laughs> is, uh, though you wouldn't always tell from the writing they did. Um, uh, they, there's an off, there's an awful lot of uh, horse race coverage of these presidential races. There's such a preoccupation with who's going to win and who's going to lose, and so little uh, real interest in what the implications of that. We were talking earlier today. You're talking a lot about polling and and yeah. Well, what I mean, this is a, this is an obsession of mine now. The public polling um, is so uh, voluminous now. I mean, any any two kids with an abacus can do a poll at the corner grocery store and some national news organization will cover it as if it's news, right? The, uh, you know, the Billy and Tommy poll came out today. Uh, and, uh, and many of these polls were methodologically um, uns uh, unsound and yet, and they produced results that were wholly different than what we knew to be the case. Uh, and yet they would drive coverage. The Gallup poll was, uh, uh, wildly deficient throughout this race. Um, and, you know, just days before the election, they said we were seven points behind. And what does that do to a campaign <clears throat> on either side in any race when you have that kind of cycle happening? This you know, race the, we, had, we had a wonderful group and a great campaign. We had, we had very solid data 
Um, and we had all kinds of kind of fail-safe uh, uh, apparatuses to, uh, uh, to check our conclusions. And we were very, very comfortable with where we were in the race. Um, the frustration was that <clears throat> our supporters would read this and it would send, especially in Washington, which is the world's uh, biggest echo chamber, uh, people would get nervous, people would get worried, you know, and when those things happen, um, you find everyone's very generous with their advice. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the frustration was less that we were worried where we were as it would affect other people's behavior yeah. and it would create disillusionment among our uh, supporters. So we spent uh, much of the campaign fighting back against some of these polls. And what was remarkable about this race, just looking at the data that we had, wasn't how volatile it was, it was how uh, steady it was. I mean, we, from February through November, uh, you know, we were running um, in our own uh, data, generally a two to four point lead. And we never ever fell behind. And uh, there was a period in September uh, when uh, after the conventions, we had a strong convention. They had not so strong convention. And then uh, came this 47% tape. And uh, we were, you know, we, we got a six or seven point lead in the battleground states at that point, largely because independent voters who were Republican leaning uh, moved away from Romney. <clears throat> he got those back pretty quickly after the first debate, yeah. which, uh, we, which we strategically planned to add a little suspense. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot in each of those elements to pick up on because they were sort of <laughs> signal points. In the the last one was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's though stay with that first debate for a second. You've talked a lot about it. Uh, you certainly have answered the question millions of times about you know, how the president would respond in the second debate. Take me to the moment as the debate is ending. Which, the, the first debate? The first debate. <clears throat> and, Do we have to go back there? <laughs> and before you walk outside to address the media. Mm -hmm. What was going on behind the scenes? What was going on in your mind? Uh, I was thinking, can't someone else do this? <laughs> you know, the truth of the matter is I, don't th I didn't feel at that moment that I knew that it wasn't a good night for us. I knew it was a good night for Romney. I didn't feel the president had substantively uh, done as badly as you know, some of our friends I uh, thought they did. MSNBC was relentless that night. And, you know, there are a few others, good supporters of ours in the media. Andrew Sullivan uh, was, uh, you know, on uh, suicide watch uh, <laughs> after, after that debate. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I didn't think it was as bad. And I did think that it was absolutely, and one of the reasons the president was a little off kilter was, I really believe that the audacity of Romney's repositioning in that debate was so remarkable that I certainly had stuff to work with when I went out to talk to the media, but you know, it wasn't something that I, had, that I looked forward to any more than I would a root canal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the biggest surprise or the biggest surprises for this cycle for you? Um, you know, a glib answer would be the big surprise for me was how few surprises there were. And um, that was partly because we had really, I think, prepared very well. We, had a, we knew where the race was. So you were often. confident throughout? Confident throughout. I, I mean, really a was. lot of supporters were not nearly as confident. I understand. Yeah, Silver was I tried to tell them. Uh, but uh, I really was confident because I felt we had the best messenger and the best message. Sure, I, I mean, I know. Now, I mean, here's my, here, I, I, I here's some surprises. I know you believe that, I'm not going to say that, but I'm just, I mean, were, what were the moments of doubt? You started to say, wait a second, this thing, this thing could turn on us here if we're not careful. Um, <clears throat> the closest that you came to was, I guess, after that first debate, but I, n I didn't really believe that it was a hit to the main engine. I thought what, what, what did, would happen did happen, which is that he'd get back those Republicans that <clears throat> he had, um, that he had lost, and that the race would tighten up, and that's what happened. And really, it happened over the course of three or four days. After that Sunday, after the debate, which I believe was on a Thursday night, uh, the race uh, leveled off, and it never, um, 
it never changed. We, it widened out a little bit, but it never really changed much um, after that. But in terms of surprises, um, I was surprised a little bit about what some of the other, uh, some of the things that the other side did. I was surprised uh, by uh, the fact that uh, the super PACs, uh, which spent you know an unbelievable amount of money in this race, didn't go on the air until May against us. And we had our greatest fear, frankly, was that they would go up and use their money to attack us in the first three months of the year when we really weren't fortified to respond. I mean, our air defenses were not ready. Um, we just didn't have the resources to, uh, to, to do that. And, uh, you know, they gave us a, a pass for whatever reason, and I don't know why uh, that was. I was surprised about what I mentioned earlier, that the Romney campaign did not flesh him out in a more uh, substantial way. Uh, when they had the opportunity uh, to do that. I was surprised by his choice of a vice presidential candidate, frankly. Why? Not as surprised as I was when John McCain picked <laughs> Sarah Palin, but. What about the Paul Ryan selection surprised you? It surprised me because I thought that it was a choice that played very much to the base of his party at a time when he needed to broaden out his appeal. And it seemed to me, one of the things that I felt about the Romney campaign was that they always were trying to grapple with the next challenge on the theory that if they just kept moving one foot in front of another, just being on the ballot with Barack Obama because of all the conventional wisdom that you cited earlier was enough. And so the game was just to get to the next square. And uh, I, know, uh, you know, I think they had concerns about their convention, which was not really, it was a very con uh, you know, conservative, uh, group and um, representing many different candidates uh, and they never fully embraced Romney and so I felt that the Ryan choice was in part uh, an effort to make sure that that event uh, went well um, but uh, you know I, I think the other thing that surprised me about it I mean it cleaved him closer to the House Republicans who were you know I think they were polling down, Congress was polling, you know, nine, ten percent. And when you think about that, every poll has a margin of error of plus or minus four percent. So a few more points, and it could be that nobody in America. Will. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, to pick someone who he identified as the intellectual leader of the Republican Party, who was clearly um, a very uh, significant leader of that caucus. Um, was surprising uh, to me. And the other thing that surprised me was Ryan was so identified with the privatization of Social Security, with um, uh, the Medicare voucher idea, um, that it almost guaranteed that we were then going to have a lengthy debate about those ideas. And uh, so instead of talking about the economy, which is where they said they wanted this to be, this play out, uh, we had a lengthy um, a debate about the economy and I, I about a Medicare, and I don't think that that redounded to their benefit. I think if you look at Florida and other places, um, you know, we we um, our number the, our numbers among senior citizens were probably higher than we uh, anticipated. You you're you're noted for the the Axelrod dictum, which I believe goes something like you're never as as smart as you think you are or perceived you're to be. You're never you smart win. as you uh, when you win and you're never as dumb as you look when you lose. Yeah. So I've had experience. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been talking about from your perspective some of the shortcomings of the Romney campaign. What did the Romney campaign or the Republican Party as as a whole do well, do you think? What were the things that that you think were effective and, and could be problematic for Democrats? I'm thinking about Rahm Emanuel's op-ed piece in the Washington Post just a couple of days ago. Um, saying, don't rest on your laurels, Democrat. Yeah, well, that's for sure. I mean, I, I think, look, I think it's important for uh, us to uh, carry through on the commitments of the campaign. You can't treat a campaign as a one-off and then go on and pursue a different agenda, and I don't think the president will. There is a, we have lots of uh, challenges that we need to meet, but there's one sort of uh, uber challenge, and that is this challenge of how we build the economy in the 21st century. Uh, that offers the greatest possible opportunity for the largest number uh, of people. And that is, that's going to require a, a sustained, long-term commitment to the th some of the things I mentioned earlier, to education, to research and, 
uh, innovation and technology to clean energy to 21st century uh, infrastructure and to getting our institutional uh, health care reform, to see health care reform through, to, to see uh, modern uh, oversight uh, of the uh, financial system and so on. There are so many things we have to follow through on here in order to move the ball down the field on that larger uh, question. In terms of what the Republican Party uh, did right, I, I don't, um, I mean they raised money well. I mean, seriously, that's, they did that very well. We never expected Romney to be able to raise the resources that he raised after running this primary race. And, um, you know, we en ended up getting outspent quite a bit uh, at the end. We made a decision that we would spend, um, we would overspend, uh, you know, from the standpoint of budgeting in the months from May to August, through August, on the theory that Television is television advertising is impactful in a presidential race in inverse proportion to the attention people are paying. So by September and October, people are disregarding ads and they're just watching the coverage and they're watching debates. And it, it's very hard to point, I can't think of a presidential race that was won on the basis of a television ad that ran after Labor Day. And so, you know, but so we've, we, they've, they back-loaded, we front-loaded. I think that was a smart uh, plan on our part, but they had a heck of a lot of money at the end, and that was you know, a source of some concern. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that last statement. I mean, I, my chronology is not after I'm thinking, you know, what about 88 or Willie Horton ads? I don't know what All in the, the summer. Second. All in the summer. All so the summer. summer is a key period Swift for... Swift boat, yeah. all in the summer. Um, you were talking a little bit about the the second term of President Obama. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about that. But from the perspective of the first term, a, a lot of hands have been wrung, a lot of ink has been spilled among key supporters of the president, avid supporters in 2008, um, who saw a campaign that was as focused as any, as disciplined as any in message. Uh, for some reason, uh, they would say not being able to effectively communicate a message, well, not being able to effectively really um, follow through on many of the plans and uh, win over the public behind those plans. When you talk to supporters of this president who have that opinion, who are, who are disillusioned or skeptical, what, what do you say to them? What I say is, uh, I was with Barack Obama in 2008 when he promised to end the war in Iraq, and he ended the war in Iraq. I was with him when he promised to pass comprehensive health reform, and against all odds, he passed comprehensive uh, health reform. I was with him when he talked about uh, ending the don't ask, don't tell policy, and he ended the don't ask, don't tell policy. I was with him when he talked about putting more women and, and uh, uh, making the Supreme Court more reflective of the country, and I saw him uh, appoint two splendid women, including the first Latina, uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, and I, I can go on at some, and I was with him when he saved this economy from sliding into a second Great Depression. And what I'm proudest of is that all the time that I was with him at the, in the White House, and I was the keeper of the polling, uh, each time uh, you know, I reported to him on, uh, what the, uh, on the sort of political uh, calculation behind particular issues, he was uh, always dismissive. I always say what I like about him so much is that he listened to me so little. Um, <laughs> And I, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, I was in the room when he decided that we needed to intervene to save the American auto industry. And today that may seem like a no-brainer, but back then it was polling miserably. Even in Michigan, uh, people didn't want us to intervene to save the auto industry. And we had a lengthy meeting with the auto team. They described the steps that would be necessary and the probability of success. And uh, what he and I, reported on the polling, and he said, look, I, I completely understand why people feel that way, but he said, if we, if we don't do anything, we're going to lose an iconic American industry. A million jobs will go with it in the, in the midst of the worst recession since the Great Depression. So if we can get them to rationalize uh, their industry and start making cars that people want to buy in the 21st century, and they've got a good chance to succeed, we got to take that shot. And he did. And, uh, uh, I think the results are clear now. On health care, uh, you know, uh, I can categorically report to you that there wasn't anybody who was telling him that taking on health care was a good political issue. 
Um, we knew even in the campaign in the general election of 2008 what a difficult issue it was and our great fear was that McCain was going to run against us uh, on health care in the general election and we kind of took the offensive on it uh, to try and stop that. But, um, you know, the president said uh, we've been trying to solve this problem for 60 years. If we don't do it in the first two years, it's never going to get done. And uh, he said, you know, we're not here to husband our popularity and admire it on the shelf. We're here to use it to get things done that are going to make a permanent difference uh, and, uh, for the better in the life of this country. So, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I was with him, uh, the last story, I was with him uh, the day before uh, Osama bin Laden was uh, killed. And uh, I didn't know, I, by now I'm out of the White House, I go back there, it's a Saturday afternoon, that evening is the White House Correspondents' Dinner. So I just went back there to help on jokes. <laughs> and uh, this is, and we had lunch, and a, at the lunch he had just been down to Alabama, where there had been a terrible storm, and he was telling me stories about people he met down there. He'd seen Gabby Giffords at, at Cape Canaveral, and he was talking about how well she was doing. Uh, he had seen her right after she'd been shot, and he never, Imagine she could have recovered uh, from that at all, and uh, we had it was just a normal conversation. And then we came. The speechwriters came in. They uh, uh, we went through the uh, jokes. We got to a joke, um, and the joke was poor Tim Pawlenty. He had he has such promise, but for that unfortunate middle name, Bin Laden. <laughs> and uh, o o Obama gets to this joke. And he says, eh, "Let's take this out." I said, "Why?" He says, "Bin Laden." He says, "That's so." That's so hackneyed. He said, he said that's so yesterday. Really? He said, let's, <laughs> let's, really? Let's take it out. And, uh, but, you know, and, and someone says, well, you know, we can stick in Hosni, and, uh, uh, who was still in power at the time. And, uh, and uh, Obama said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And I'm thinking, that's not funny at all. <laughs> but he's the president. We put in Hosni. Uh, and the next night, uh, my wife Susan sitting over here, we were, uh, uh, where are you? Yeah, there you are. Uh, say hello to my wife Susan. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, K through 12 uh, lab schooler. So, that's only one of her many distinctions. Uh, but um, the, um, uh, so I, I went to sleep early the next night. I'd done a television show in the morning. I was tired. I went to sleep. Susan wake me, woke me up. She said, I think you better get up. I think they just got Bin Laden. And I like throw the sheets off and I'm, I look at my Blackberry, which is blowing up, you know, <laughs> and say, why turn on the TV and so on. And, you know, I realized as I was watching the president speak that he knew at the time that we had gotten together the day before that he had ordered this mission. He knew that if it had gone poorly, uh, not only would lives be lost, would our security be roiled, but uh, his political career was probably, would probably be over. And he was completely calm because he felt he had done the right thing. So, you know, I hear what our supporters have to say, and I, uh, I love our supporters, I appreciate our supporters, but I am very, very proud of this president and what he accomplished under very difficult circumstances uh, over the first four years. You got your start in politics as a five-year-old kid, as I understand it. Yes. Lower East Side of Manhattan. Yes. Uh, a yes. rally for JFK. I was running yes. for president in 1960. Yes. 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 I, uh, I grew up, I don't know how many people are from New York City, but I grew up in a housing development called Stuyvesant Town that was built for returning war veterans. And um, my mother uh, was at work, and uh, there was a woman who took care of me named Jessie Berry, um, came down from Harlem, great, great lady kind of classic American story. She came up from the South, you know, didn't have much of a formal education, but like a PhD in life. And she, uh, and she heard that John F. Kennedy was coming to our community. It was 10 days before the 1960 election. Uh, and uh, she thought I should see it. And she took me out and put me on top of a mailbox on 20th Street, which is a huge boulevard. And I watched as this canyon filled in with people and this very charismatic, uh, young man spoke and I um, uh, and I was hooked you know and I didn't I, I mean I didn't know what he was saying 
I didn't understand what he was saying. I wasn't that precocious. <laughs> but, um, but I knew it seemed really important and really exciting. And um, uh, what, what now I know from Google what he said, because they recorded all his speeches. And part of what he said was, uh, I'm not running on the platform that says, if you elect me, things will be easy. He's being an American citizen in the 1960s is a hazard, is hazardous duty. It's filled with peril, but also with hope. And we'll decide which path we take. And I thought those were actually, I, think, I thought back at those were about those words quite a bit over the last four years because there was a parallel, another young president coming to office at a time of great uh, peril. But I also think, Steve, a lot about that woman who took me there, Jessie Berry, because she had a very difficult life, um, and yet she had hope about the future. And I think about what she must have, she would have thought, knowing that that little boy she put on the mailbox was working for the President of the United States, and that the President of the United States would be an African-American man named Barack Obama. I mean, it's an incredible thing. You know? yeah. Was your household a household where politics and current events were part of the conversation on a regular basis? Yeah, they were. Your parents and your sister? Yeah, yeah, they were, they were. Um, and that was part of my interest. I had, uh, back in the New York City public schools, I had a great teacher early in, like first and third grades, I skipped second grade, first and third grades, and she would, uh, our teacher, Mrs. Roth, would read, uh, we'd read the newspaper and she you know, we talk about Martin Luther King, and who was, um, you know, that was right in the middle of all of that, and the civil rights movement, and um, you know, she just exposed us to a lot. I mean, there were a lot of things uh, at play, but I was just a, a junkie. By the time I was nine years old, uh, I was handing out leaflets for Robert Kennedy, and and uh, I always say when I was ten, I made a big decision and broke with the Democratic Party. Uh, <laughs> and uh, went to work for John Lindsay, who was running for mayor of New York. <laughs> but I wouldn't work for him at the Republican headquarters. I, I went down to the Liberal Party headquarters, because <laughs> in New York you could run on two lines. And I was handing out leaflets on a street corner in New York, and um, some uh, woman thought this was really cute, this little boy handing out leaflets. And she asked me why, and I made the case for Lindsay, and got an early start on my political consulting career, made the case against his opponent as well. <laughs> And um, she said, this is so cute. And she gave me, she said, this is for you. And she hands me a box of what looked to be pastry, a uh, white box with string. So I took it back to the Liberal Party headquarters. And I, uh, we opened it up. And there was all these, there were all these donuts and a wad of $10 bills. And so in one of my early, uh, early lessons in politics, the district leader grabbed the money and said, you can keep the donuts. <laughs> You also, with a, with a friend, a classmate, sold bumper stickers. For Robert Kennedy when he ran Kennedy. for president. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and buttons and other things. But you so know, I'll tell you something. Uh, that, uh, th those of us who've lived, who lived through it remember that was a time of great tumult, but also of great idealism. And that campaign was infused with idealism as tragically as it ended. Uh, and when, uh, uh, when Senator Obama was thinking about running for president, we had a long talk about it. and. Uh, I said to him, you know, you're too young to remember that. But we really haven't had a campaign since that time that was really, uh, that, that really energized people in that way. And uh, especially young people. And we ought to try and build that kind of campaign. And, and I'm proud that we were able to do that. And I thought, I thought about that a lot when I come into the headquarters in this campaign and see these hundreds and hundreds of incredibly um, gifted, well-motivated kids who just wanted to, changed the world. That was why they were there. They weren't there for any smaller reason. And certainly the president seemed to feel that way as well with that, that video of him speaking to the staff he the really, after. Where he, he did. It was, that was an incredibly that. moving moment. Um, I'd seen a little of it on the night before we were in Des Moines and he was talking. It was his last campaign speech ever uh, for himself and he talked and it all began in of course Iowa. And he talked about these, we, these magnificent young people who worked for us for a year and a half in Iowa in 2007 and two, 2008. And he talked about uh, what it meant to him that they were so devoted, not to him, but to the country and to their vision of what the country could be. And he kind of choked up there. But yeah, it was, uh, it was an incredible moment. And then what you couldn't see on the tape was that after he had this uh, made this very inspiring 
uh, talk to these young volunteers. He went, and there were hundreds and hundreds of them, he went around to every single one of them uh, and gave them a hug and talked to them and encouraged them. And I saw them, most of them, the next night was a going away party for the staff. And every single one of those kids, you could tell this was something they were going to hold for the rest of their lives, you know. So, you know, add to the list of things that I'm proud of is that uh, I'm proud that uh, this president has helped inspire a bunch of young people uh, to get involved. You know, we're here obviously having this conversation on the campus of the University of Chicago where the Institute of Politics that you're leading uh, will be housed. And thinking about your time here as an undergraduate on campus, yes. uh, some years ago you had a chance to go to Columbia University, you decided to come here, thinking Man, about just the young done people your research. That, <laughs> that, that President Obama had a chance to touch. So uh, tell me who David Axelrod is at, at 20 years old, as you are, as I understand, writing for community newspapers, yes. thinking about a world of politics here in Chicago. How are you envisioning your, your future career at that point? You know, um, first of all, I came to Chicago <clears throat> largely be, well, for a couple of reasons. The, um, uh, I had a homeroom teacher at Stuyvesant High School who, uh, so I'm just going to give you one piece of advice said to the whole class. He said, draw, get a map, draw a circle around the city of New York, 600 miles, and go to school outside that line because your parents will never surprise you with a visit if they have to take an airplane. <laughs> uh, but the, the bigger reason was that uh, I wanted to go to a school in an urban area, and I wanted to go to school where, in a place where the politics were rich. And you know, this was four years after the Democratic Convention. The last of the big city machines was still alive here. Politics were very vital. Uh, I came to the University of Chicago, frankly, l probably ill-equipped to, to take advantage of everything this uh, institution had to offer, um, and a little frustrated because there was no institute of politics, there were, there were no outlets. Um, I used to joke, but I, and forgive me if the, uh, the dean is here or anybody else, but that was 40 years ago, I had, the statute has passed on this. Um, I said, uh, uh, that, you know, I couldn't find anybody who wanted to talk about anything that happened after the year 1800. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, so I found other outlets for my interests, and that outlet was writing. I went back to New York uh, after my freshman year, got a job at a newspaper in Greenwich Village, the, the Villager newspaper, used that experience to leverage uh, a spot. Bruce Sagan, some of you may know, great, great Illinoisan. Uh, hired me, uh, this isn't why he's a great Illinoisan, but <laughs> does influence my thinking, um, to, uh, to write a political column. I was 19 uh, for the Hyde Park Herald, and, um, and I was a stringer for publications. This really sort of became the focus of my activity uh, when I was here, and it was largely to sate my interest in, in politics, but I didn't have any life plan. I didn't expect that someday I'd be working for the President of the United States. I didn't, uh, I, I, I didn't know that I wasn't going to be a newspaper man. Uh, I really love journalism. I still love and believe in journalism. Um, I worry a little bit about, you know, the, uh, what's happening to it and whether people can find ways to monetize good journalism uh, so that there's an incentive to keep doing it, uh, keep publishing it. But um, uh, but so, you know, my, I always tell young people, it's very, you can make a 30-year plan, but it's very rare that you actually can execute on it. And uh, better to follow your passions if you can and go where life leads you. And, you know, where life has led me has been extraordinary, up to and including the ability to help start this, this institute. Um, you as a reporter and political columnist for the Chicago Tribune, um, what, you spent about eight years at the paper, yes. something like that? Right out of college, yes. um, are steeped in the, the culture and reality of politics in a city like this. You told me in passing once that, that everything you have come to know about politics really began from that experience. Yeah. So what did you learn about politics from covering it as a reporter in Chicago? Well, you know, Tip O'Neill said all politics is local. And I actually, it, I, I, was, I thought about that as I traveled around the world with the president and I, and I heard f foreign leaders and their, 
their aides talk about the challenges they were facing, you know. So at the same time that they were all getting together to engage in discussion about the problems of the world, they all were looking over their shoulder at, you know, their own constituencies, the, 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 the other party, the, you know. And um, so, um, you know, the, 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 and getting to sort of the motivation, the root, uh, the sort of interests. Is the culture different here? I mean, having spent time now all over the country, is, is there something different here? Well, that seems like a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I think there's a rich tradition in Chicago politics, and there's a politician, there's a tradition of politicians trying to get rich. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, and you know the first is good and the second is not. I, I think that people are passionate about their politics here, and um, politics is very local. And you know I admire. I, I'm a big aficionado of urban politics. I've done a lot of mayors' races around the country, in part because this is where the rubber hits the road. Mayors deal with life and death issues, with quality of life issues, and they're responsible. City council members are responsible, uh, and so that's something that I think people. Um, uh, I think that, and, and, and there's something very good about that. Obviously, there's a tradition of, uh, of corruption that's touched our politics, and you know, our last two governors are in prison. That is not a shining note for the land of Lincoln. Um, but, uh, but I think there are also some very good people uh, here who, who care deeply about their constituents, and there's a vitality to our politics. That, uh, that I appreciate. We're going to be taking questions from those of you in the audience as well. So in just a few minutes, we'll bring out some microphones. We'll ask that you uh, line up behind those microphones. In fact, uh, we have some of the members of the Student Advisory Committee are up there now. So for those of you that do have a question for David, please go ahead and make your way down to those microphones on either side here. And we'll take those questions in, in just a second. Um, there's so much I, I'm fascinated by in terms of your your, your transition from journalism to political consulting, um, all that kind of stuff. But, but let me jump to the Institute of Politics now, because I think it speaks to y your interest in uh, trying to improve the political culture, broadly speaking. Yeah. Why start this here now? What's, what, what well, it? partly it was because of my experience 40 years ago, because I realized as magnificent an institution as this is, and it attracts such incredible students, that there could be more to uh, help expose students to uh, the possibilities of a career in the public arena. And I don't mean just as a candidate, but as uh, advisors, as policy people, as speech writers, as you know, the whole gamut that go into uh, the, the, public, uh, the, the public discourse and um, uh, journalism itself, uh, uh, you know, and coverage and analysis. Um, <coughs> all of it is very vital and uh, I want to expose students to practitioners in the field uh, and uh, who are good examples and give them a chance to, you know, and give them a, mo a model to think about uh, as they're choosing careers. Uh, because we need uh, talented, well-motivated young people. I, you know, and, and it's easy to turn away. I mean, there's a lot about our politics that is, um, um, you know, frustrating and, and dispiriting. It's easy to turn away from it. But if you turn away, then you're just yielding to those things that make politics frustrating and dispirited, uh, dispiriting. The only way to truly change it is to get in the arena and, uh, and make a difference. And, uh, you know, in this auditorium and on this campus, there are, peop there are young people who are uniquely equipped to make a difference. And, you know, when the president uh, 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 teared up at that uh, event, what he said was, I, I feel good about the future because I know every single person in this room in some form or fashion is going to make a difference. And uh, so, you know, I, I've run my races uh, and I want to encourage young people to, to get in the arena and run theirs. There's more to be said and asked about that very thing, but let's move to some questions from the audience. Let me start on the left side first. 
Hello, Mr. Axelrod. Uh, Hello. At the start of the conversation, you mentioned something about uh, Gallup polls uh, results not matching up with your own internal estimates, and I was curious about like how, what kind of internal estimates do you have? Like, is it similar to the 538 model built by Nate Silver, or it's like other quantitative models? And how much do you think that like quantitative methods? play uh, in the success of a political campaign? First of all, is there a, a more famous alumnus of this institution right now than Nate, <laughs> than Nate Silver? Silver? No. <laughs> uh, it's a, uh, well, I think it's important to know where you are in a race and, you know, the goal is to win and uh, so it's, it's important to know uh, where you are and also to understand how people react to um, a whole range of issues and ideas and concepts and words and uh, so research is important but it's only valuable if it's accurate and so you know we invested a lot and we had very a uh, large number of smart people and I should at this juncture uh, deliver a little bit of an advertisement that in uh, the winter we're going to be spending six weeks uh, am I not supposed to announce this? No this is okay. good. I, <laughs> This would be an awkward time to say yes. Uh, we're going to spend, uh, spend six weeks really drilling deeply into the presidential race, and one of those weeks is going to be on polling and research. Uh, and part of what we'll evaluate is, is these public polls. Why did they differ so greatly from the data that we had and so on? So um, they really are important. I think they are, like anything else, if you abuse them, they're, 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 they can be a negative uh, in a campaign, if you treat polling like a connected dot where you're just trying to match up where, with wherever public opinion is at the time, I think it can be, um, polling can be really destructive. Um, but if you use it to understand how to present the ideas that you have uh, and see how people react to them and what nuances are important and what aren't, or which aren't, um, if, you, if you use it to, to, to understand where your strength is and where your strength isn't and where to put your resources and where not to. It's, it's invaluable. You can't run a campaign without good research. It's like building a, a 747 and leading, leaving a guidance system off. You, you have to have it, but you gotta make sure the guidance system works or you're gonna you know, land in the Pacific Ocean. Let's take a question from this side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, previously you mentioned that I uh, was a surprised that Mitt Romney chose Paul Ryan as his running mate. Uh, who did you think he was going to pick, if you had any pick? It's a really good question. I, um, I, for the longest time, I thought he might pick uh, uh, Tim Pawlenty, and I'll tell you why, because, um, uh, first of all, he, Pawlenty, from the moment that he got out of the race, became a very good surrogate for Romney. He was a better surrogate for Romney than he had been for himself. And, uh, but running, Running in these national races is really, really hard. I remember the day that Obama, that we learned, we were leaving Denver after the convention in 2008, and we learned that, um, uh, that on the plane that uh, McCain had chosen Sarah Palin. So I go up to the front of the plane, pre uh, Senator Obama's up there, Senator Biden, our newly uh, designated vice presidential candidate, and um, uh, I told Obama, what had happened, and Obama said, yeah, I wonder why he did that, and he goes through all the permutations in his head, and he said, but you know what? He said, um, I, I think I'm reasonably smart, and he said, it took me f like six months to figure out how to be a presidential candidate, how to be, how to deal with this, the spotlight, how to deal with this maelstrom that is national politics. He said, she may be the smartest can, uh, politician ever, and she may be able to come out of Alaska after a year and a half and handle all this. He said, but I give it three weeks, and in three weeks we'll know if this is real. Three weeks to the day she did her interview with Katie Couric, <laughs> uh, literally to the day that uh, effectively ended uh, it for, for her. And uh, so I, I thought that they might make a conservative choice of pick someone who had had at least a taste of the national uh, stage, or, uh, and this was uh, more of a consensus in the political community that, that, it, that he might pick uh, Rob Portman, the senator from Ohio, because Ohio was so critical. Portman uh, was uh, a guy who, who could, was a center-right conservative, could uh, appeal maybe more broadly 
Um, so uh, I think a lot of people were surprised by the choice. Do you think a Portman choice uh, potentially could have changed the outcome in Ohio? And, and I don't know. I, I, Ohio was close. We won by two points. So, you know, you can say anything might have made a difference. He, his polling in Ohio wasn't all that strong. He's not that big a presence uh, there. But um, I think, I'm sure, that uh, there's a lot of uh, reflection on that over in, in Romney land. One other follow-up uh, had to do with the, the point that you were relaying and passing about just the adjustment period that President Obama felt he had to undergo to become a presidential candidate, yep. be comfortable in that skin. Mm -hmm. Help me understand what is, what, what, what are the difficult things you have to learn? So you've been a, you, you run for governor, you've been a congressman. What's, what's different? What's different is just the intense, relentless scrutiny everywhere he went. Remember, he, most candidates get to begin, you know, with, uh, no, with very little press or no press in rooms of 10 and 12. And, 14 people. He came to this race with such ballyhoo that it was like, you know, you know, you sometimes you start a play in New Haven and take it to Broadway. He opened up right on Broadway. Yeah. And all the reviewers were in the front row from the first day. And so as he was developing his chops as a presidential candidate, they were already evaluating him. And if you look at his press for the first four to five months of that primary, it was very, very negative. He was underperforming. He was overrated. Uh, he was a lot of critique of the early debates. Uh, yes, in that uh, they were bad. Well. You know, the they were, he, Yes, yeah. And he said at the time, he said, "I'm not a good candidate." Now he said, "But I will become one." He said, "I'm going to learn how to become a good candidate." And he challenged himself, and he did become. In, in all of candidate. your experience with candidates, you know, people talk about oh, for a campaign to be successful, you need fundraising and organization and message and all of those things. What are the intangibles that candidates need that sort of separate in the end? The one oh, I think authenticity, them? honestly. Um, now, you know, uh, I always think about, and I thought about this a lot when I was watching um, the other campaign, but, you know, George uh, Burns used to joke that all you need uh, uh, to succeed in show business is sincerity, and if you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> but I think genuine authenticity is really important, uh, particularly in a presidential candidate. And uh, Barack Obama is very authentic. And that, that um, undergirded us in many ways, and even in this campaign. I mean, people felt comfortable with who he was. They weren't, they don't, they're not going to be surprised uh, by him. They knew what drove him, and, um, um, they, uh, and they felt comfortable with him. Let's take another question from this side. Yeah. Hi. Um, so after the Citizens United Supreme Court decision, there were a lot of worries about you know, the effect this would have on campaigns, um, especially with, you know, the effect of super donors giving millions and millions of dollars to one campaign. And I was just wondering, to what extent did super PACs affect both sides? You already talked about the Republican side a little bit. But, you know, are those fears, you know, how founded are they? How much have they come to light? Is there something to be hopeful about? I'm just wondering about your, <laughs> your views in general. Well, the thing to be hopeful about is that, uh, you know, a billion dollars or so were spent uh, on, and then a billion more from the Romney side uh, against us, and we were able to win. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars were spent uh, against uh, Democratic candidates by uh, some of these big Republican super PACs. And I only say Republican. There were Democratic super PACs as well. Uh, there was obviously one on our side that uh, did some effective ads, but uh, the preponderance of the money was spent on their side, and a lot of it was in these uh, were in these high-profile Senate races, and almost all of their targets law uh, all uh, won. Almost all of the candidates they supported uh, lost. And I'm not saying that that money didn't mean anything. I think it meant something, and it, it and it put enormous pressure on the Democratic candidates and. and super PAC supporting them to try and match it. Um, but it wasn't determinative. It was, I think, more so in congressional races where people get less information and are more subject to being influenced by ads. But you know, here in our own area, we saw some races. Uh, quite a bit of money was spent against Bill Foster uh, in the suburbs, and he still won overwhelmingly. Six million dollars in super PAC money was spent against, I think that's the number, Tammy Duckworth 
in her race and she still was able uh, to win. So, you know, I don't think it's a healthy thing for our, uh, for our, uh, for the body politic to have people writing, you know, 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 million dollar checks, but it, it is, um, you know, uh, it's a reality that we may have to live with if we can't change it, and I think we should try and change it, um, you know, through whatever means are appropriate or, or, or available. And the Supreme Court, you know, if the Supreme Court changes over time, they may want to reevaluate some of this. But I, I fear the genie may be out of the bottle here. And so I'm heartened by the fact that um, we were able to overcome it in this election. I worry about the future. Not every candidate's going to have the particular advantages that Barack Obama had, both in terms of his base and his ability to raise money. And so, you know, um, it's a continuing concern. Let's take another question from this side. Thank you. Um, this is on. Um, it, there seems to be this growing consensus or this growing perception that, unlike past Democratic presidents such as Bill Clinton or FDR, President Obama has not really left a sort of ideological or programmatic format as to like what it means to be a Democrat. Sort of like Bill Clinton had the whole new Democratic philosophy. There is really doesn't seem to be any equivalent with President Obama. So there's this. What I've been gathering there's there's has been this fear that with the party tent growing so big with the Republicans moving further to the right, that there could be in the coming years a sort of battle for the soul of the party for the next in the next four to eight years. Like, do you see like in, the, in a sort of a post Obama age like some sort of civil war like uh, <laughs> occasion happening or like what well, we just pushed forward? the post Obama age off for four years I, I know I know but like even so, even uh, within like the four even within like the, the next yeah, four look, years look what I would tell you is I think what uh, this president stands for and I mean I, I talked earlier about the fight we had I was just um, you know I was reading a book um, which some of you may have read that came out last year biography of Clarence Darrow that was excellent by John Farrell and he talked about some of the fights in the late 19th century and early 20th century, um, you know, during the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. And so much of the dialogue, I mean, it was a little more heated, but, uh, and obviously um, there were differences, but the fundamental philosophical debate was very much the same one we had in this election, which is, you know, do we believe that the strength of our country and the strength of the economy comes from you know, the broad number of people, the middle class and those working to get into the middle class, and or do we believe that it comes from the wealth generating capacity of those at the top? Um, this has been a uh, long standing debate, and I think it was very vital in this election. And President Obama, I think, carried that banner high and proudly and well. And uh, the things that he's done, uh, whether it's health reform, uh, or education reform, making higher education more affordable, that high, you know, uh, expanding Pell Grants, um, you know, the, the, everything, all the major things, you know, creating the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, they're all aimed at one thing, which is to create a, a, a country, an economy in which we've got a vital middle class and, uh, uh, you know, our, our tax policy reflected that as well. Uh, and uh, opportunity is broadly available. Um, I think that's solidly in the mainstream of the Democratic Party. Now, we can have a debate about uh, uh, means of achieving that, and I think we have to really do some soul searching about how in the 21st century we achieve those goals and whether um, all the avenues and pathways that, were, uh, that made sense 50 and 60 and 70 years ago are, are, are still um, valid today. Many of them may be, some may not. But I think on the fundamental goal, he's solidly in the tradition of the Democratic Party, solidly in the progressive tradition, and, um, uh, and I think that's a lot of what this election was about. The side of the room, another question for him. Um, in this election, it, it's been observed that um, much of the advertising um, was predominantly negative. And I, I would like to ask about, I know both sides of the, both campaigns engaged in this. Um, uh, it comes to mind like an Obama ad that um, seemed to insinuate that a woman, uh, that Bain was responsible for a woman losing her insurance and therefore somehow caused her death. And just um, ads like that seemed to 
degrade the whole political process, and I, I just wanted your comments on negative advertisement in general. Well, I, 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 <clears throat> I agree that there are ads that degrade the political process, um, and you know I saw many of them uh, in the last campaign, and many of them aimed at us. Um, on that particular ad, I just want to straighten one thing out. That was not an ad from the Obama campaign. It was an ad from a super PAC. Uh, we made clear that we didn't think that was appropriate, uh, that to accuse Romney of somehow being responsible for that woman's death was inappropriate. Uh, I should point out that that ad ran exactly one time in this whole broad, big country. And partly, I suppose, because we made our disapprobation known publicly. Um, so now, were there legitimate issues about uh, Bain and Romney's business practices? Um, I, I really believe there were, and it goes to this debate, the larger debate, which is, um, you know, if you, if you outsource jobs and cut benefits and destroy pensions, take countries, uh, companies to bankruptcy, uh, profit off those bankruptcies while workers lose their pensions and their jobs and their benefits, um, is that a good, it may be a good business practice for you. Is it a good policy for the country? No. Um, so there were legitimate issues, but that was not one of them. That was not a, an appropriate uh, ad, and, and we said so. But look, at your, to your broader question, um, this was a very tough election. And um, you know, it was tough on both sides. As I said earlier, Romney, more than 90% of the ads he ran in the primary were negative. And uh, you know, he didn't change his habits in the general. Um, so, uh, and we had to make a case as well. Um, so, I mean, you spent a lot of time and money. I mean, there was negative ads on both sides. A lot of time and money, especially during that key period we we're talking about, really trying to define Romney. We did. We spent just just to get the sequencing down. We spent a month in the battleground states running positive advertising about the president. That's how we began our media campaign. Uh, then the we did run there, the thinking there being the thinking uh, there being shore that, up the narrative. Uh, shore that, up the accomplishments. Yes, uh, and, and we felt we had, uh, you know, we had plenty to share, and we did. Uh, but it was clear that there was, um, there was, you know, that if we just allowed Romney to be this sort of hazy, kind of, uh, you know, local chamber of commerce president, that that was, and that was the the image that people had that, you know, that that would, uh, that would not be in our interest, and it wouldn't really focus the race the way the race should be focused. If you could shorthand the takeaway, the desired takeaway you wanted voters to have after um, experiencing the, the, the ads that were run against Governor Romney, what, was the, what, what were the things that you wanted voters to believe about Governor Romney in the end? Well, I the think summary of well, basically that he was out of touch with their economic experience and that his fundamental view of the economy was not one that incorporated them. And frankly, when that 47% tape came out, it was a pretty strong ratification of our view. Yeah. You said it was the greatest gift to happen in the campaign because it, it, it reinforced the narrative that you were trying to emphasize. I mean, you know, look, the, the, these kinds of things uh, either are meaningless you know, when the president, uh, when they tried to make, uh, to spend tens of billions of dollars on the, he didn't build that thing, you didn't build that. Uh, it really fell on deaf ears because people didn't really believe that's what the president was saying. But this tape was a, not, not just a, um, a misstatement, it was like a essay. Uh, and, you know, obviously his remarks after the election seemed to reinforce that. I mean, I think this was his philosophy, this was his view. And that was a fundamentally different view than the president's. And you know, we made the case, we made it on a sustained basis, and ultimately I think it was the case that carried. I, I wanna get to more questions from the audience, but let me pull back slightly to the broader question, have you defend your profession? Myself. <laughs> yeah, no, the profession. Mm -hmm. So you know, we've talked a lot about the problems with politics, and, and I think clearly the question there alluded to, the negativity in politics, we talked about polling and the horse race. You know, th there are many people that say, you know, you want to look at particular causes and forces that sort of shape this climate. Political consultants would be one of them. Yes. So uh, 
what's, what's your response to that broad criticism about political consultants being sort of uh, associated with the worst elements of our politics as opposed to the best? Well, some are. Yeah. Some are. I mean, you know, the, you can do this in a principled way and you can do it in an unprincipled way. Uh, campaigns are hard. I mean, one thing if you read American history that you very quickly realize is that, you know, our campaigns aren't any more, and they're probably much less brutal than s some of the campaigns of the past in American history, um, but you know because of the amplification of television, of the now the internet and so on, there's an immediacy to it and a broadness to. So if uh, someone says something in uh, you know Topeka, Kansas, all, it, it goes around the world, um, you know almost immediately. Or if someone says something like Governor Romney did in a room full of supporters that he thought was a, an intimate setting you know, it ultimately wasn't an intimate. So that's changed, but uh, look, we have had strong, strongly contested elections throughout our history because there are big things at stake. And, you know, if you do your job right, you wanna make sure that people understand what it is that you're fighting for and what it is you're fighting against so that that, that, that choice is clear. Um, now, you know, I think when it, if it goes to um, you know, just the, the fabrications uh, and, uh, or worse, uh, you know, then it's something else. But Let's take another question from this side of the room. So my, uh, my question is sort of related, um, but do you believe that, um, you, you, do you believe that your campaign and Mitt Romney's campaign have uh, increased or decreased the uh, prospects of bar bi bipartisanship in the uh, in politics. <clears throat> Do uh, I think that my uh, that our campaign has increased the uh, uh, bipartisanship? Is that what you're yeah, asking? I'm sorry, uh, the, the either campaign. Do you, do you have do you have optimism um, that there yeah. will be bipartisanship? You know, I don't Barack know Obama's whether our term. campaign <laughs> or their campaign did that, but I think the voters did. I, I think that uh, you can see it already. There's a different tone uh, in Washington. Uh, I, I think elections matter, and uh, the voters spoke, and uh, even though the race was relatively close, it wasn't that close when you looked at the Electoral College, um, and uh, uh, even the margin has now expanded to four million votes, um, and, and I think people read those results. Um, I think, for example, on an Im uh, issue like immigration reform, uh, I think the prospects for for passing comprehensive immigration reform in the near future are much greater today than they were, you know, three weeks ago, uh, because of the results of the election. I think the chances of coming to a uh, agreement on, around this fiscal cliff are greater today because of this election, because politicians read election results, and so, um, you know, I don't know whether our campaign or their campaign, you know. Uh, fostered the environment for that, but I think the voters did, and that's as it should be. Let's take uh, just these last couple of questions here. We'll come back to this side. Yeah, um, I, my question is, um, in the days following the election, there was a fair amount of coverage uh, about the decisiveness of the Obama for America ground game, the field or get out the vote operation. Um, and I was sort of wondering, looking forward, uh, how unique do you think that model was to this campaign and candidate? And if this is maybe the new model of organizing and campaigning to be replicated, how is that, that going to play out in 2016, especially in an election where both candidates will have uh, had contested primaries and maybe not had the opportunity to set up uh, offices in Coralville, Iowa for a year and a half out from the election? Well, the, f uh, the field uh, has always been important in elections. Um, you know, there was a time when the field was uh, meant uh, political organizations that did field work. I mean, Chicago's, uh, Chicago is uh, renowned for uh, field work, only it was done by precinct captains for a long time. Um, uh, so field is important. It isn't a substitute for, um, I mean, I always liken it to a football game. The candidate, the message, has to get the ball close enough to the goal line so that the field can win the game. Uh, uh, so you can't simply win a race uh, uh, with field. But what's happened is the marriage of social media and traditional uh, uh, field work so that, uh, you know, we can, uh, 
we're, we're far more efficient at communicating with people. Um, we registered, I think, more voters online uh, in this uh, campaign than we registered all together in the last uh, campaign. Um, so, you know, the technology has uh, made it easier uh, to organize. And in a weird way, the technology has made it uh, easier to kind of individualize our appeals to voters and our contact and our dialogue with voters. And I think that what was done in this campaign was light years ahead of what we did in the last campaign. And whoever runs in 2016 is going to have to reinvent it again because uh, the technology changes so rapidly. No, Twitter was nothing four years ago. And look how important it was uh, in this campaign. In terms of what can, you know, one other surprise, you said what is surprising. I was surprised at how little the Republicans invested in field in their primary campaigns. And um, one thing that really uh, uh, benefited us in 2008 was we had to run a 50 state primary campaign with, uh, with Senator Clinton. And um, we, we, from the beginning, were determined to run a very aggressive field uh, campaign. So uh, we set up operations in all, all the states. And obviously, uh, in those battleground states, those organizations sustain themselves. And uh, you know, in Iowa, for example, that was very, very important. Um, so you know, I would not, given the nature of the process, at least in those early states, if I were running in 2016, I would not do what was done in the Republican race, which is just turn it into a media campaign. Because you won't leave any lasting structure that you can build on for the general. Another question over here? Um, yeah. Uh, so I was really excited when President Obama came out in favor of gay marriage. It felt like a risk, and uh, it felt kind of hard left. But I was kind of surprised by other issues that I felt that the American people cared about that the candidates were relatively silent on, uh, such as the drug war. Um, climate change and environmentalism. Uh, it took a long time before they ever talked about Afghanistan. And I was wondering if there was any uh, rhyme or reason to the avoidance of these issues. Well, um, I, I challenge you just a little bit. Uh, I think the President's talked a lot about Afghanistan and made clear that we're going to withdraw our troops uh, in 2014. And that was something that he's probably spent a great deal of time uh, talking about it, it was only uh, late in the campaign that Governor Romney engaged on that, uh, and that became a, a, uh, a debate uh, within the campaign. Uh, on the issue of climate change, uh, you know, there's no doubt that that is a central challenge uh, for us in the world. The President said in his first campaign, he said it uh, in this campaign, and some of the things that he has done doubling of fuel efficiency standards, uh, first time we've raised them in 30 uh, years, doubling of renewable energy. Uh, you know, these things are a part, uh, you know, some of the changes in environmental law uh, relative to emissions are all part of that effort. We got to do more. We have to do more. We have to build on that. Uh, but it's certainly a commitment. And one thing we ought to recognize is that there doesn't have to be a competition between. Um, our, our economy and our health and, and the health of the world because uh, renewable energy and clean energy um, has economic benefits uh, that are pronounced and people uh, understand that. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, we highlighted the issues that we felt needed to be highlighted for, uh, for the voters who were going to make the decision uh, in the election, but the President's agenda is reflected in his uh, work and uh, I expect he's going to continue to work hard on those issues. Uh, let's take these last two questions as we wrap things up here. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, Mr. Axelrod. Thanks hey. for coming back to University of Chicago. I have two quick follow-ups on. Calm down. I'm going to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for. <laughs> um, so one uh, regarding super PACs. Just now, you again um, re reclaimed your concerns about this unlimited money in campaign financing. On the other hand, we saw earlier today the lead story in Politico was about how Democrats are loving super PACs and already oiling up their machines for 2014 and 2016. So what are the prospects for repealing Citizens United or um, 
comprehensive campaign financing reform now that it seems both sides are ready to embrace the idea or at least learn to live with super PACs and knowing that the money has a limited power. I, I'm gonna, um, let, let's stay with that question, if you don't mind, just in the interest of time, because I think it's also a substantive one. Um, do you want to weigh in? And, it's and very substantive. Yeah. I, um, uh, what I will tell you is I don't, ex yes, I think we should, the president said during the campaign, we should pursue all avenues to try and, uh, and uh, restore sanity to this process, uh, you know, uh, perhaps even including a constitutional amendment. Um, but uh, it is also true that no, no side is going to, uh, given what we just saw, you're not going to see unilateral disarmament. Um, and uh, I mean, it would be foolish to do that. And uh, uh, if, as, and it's not just relative to, uh, and remember, when you talk about super PACs, there's the more insidious uh, cousin, the 501c4s that um, run essentially campaign ads under the guise of social welfare education and, um, uh, and have, are completely undisclosed. Uh, at least super PACs have to disclose their donors. Um, these 501c4s don't. And, uh, you know, so we, we, we certainly need to flush that out and make sure that, I think that they would raise far less money if people had to reveal their donations. And, this, and they would be loath to take some of the donations if they had to reveal who they were taking the money uh, from. So we have to pursue all these avenues. But in the interim, I would not, I could not advise the Democratic Party uh, to, as a matter of principle, um, just lay down arms and get mowed over uh, in the next elections. I think that would, that would be a mistake. We've got to work together, um, or we've got to move together at least. We all have to be operating under the same rules uh, or else you're going to have a, a, a disproportionate result in the election. Let's take our final question from this side of the room tonight. Uh, I've always been told to uh, say something very proactive before I throw out a curveball question. So the proactive well, thing is Thanks for the that, warning. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up on the south side in Englewood, so we're kind of like that. But um, uh, the, uh, uh, my hope is that before the uh, session concludes here that you can share with all of us again uh, how we can contribute to epilepsy research oh, my goodness. And, uh, uh, and the retirement, or at least temporary retirement, of the uh, famed mustache. Yes. And um, now for the curveball. Uh, I have this, uh, I, I'm a south side inner city ER doc for three decades. Um, and I also have a love relationship with this institution because Dr. Richard Rothberg and the pediatricians across the street saved this little boy from Englewood, uh, literally. Uh, and uh, it worked out okay for him because he became the first black president of the Chicago Medical Society. But to my point, uh, Medicare, um, you know, we, uh, Obama, let, me, let me step back. Obamacare, I have a love, um, uh, how long does this marriage have to last relationship? Uh, because it, it's just tremendous legislation, and it's just astounding. People will be talking this for, for centuries, how this happened. It's just incredible, and I love it for my patients in the inner city. And I certainly don't want us to fall back on Ryan-style vouchers for Medicare. And I certainly know as an ER doc that the, uh, that the Romney solution to universal access is not in my emergency department uh, for, for many, many reasons, okay? But you know, there's something that both Republican and Democratic wonks, uh, the, the real brainiacs, have all agreed on. W's uh, uh, budget office people agreed on it. Democratic budget wonks agreed on it. The sustainable growth rate in Medicare is much more insidious and is going to ruin Medicare long before a voucher-style system will ruin it. And, and how can you have two different party uh, parties agree on something so very fundamental and not come together and get it done? It's a big question and a great one. David? Yes. Uh, but don't let me. Yes. I, I don't want to get out of we'll here without answering it. I got to. Yes. Uh, and, and I want to make one other point, which is that uh, I have a, a, a love affair with the institution as well because Susan's father, uh, Dr. Richard Landau, was on the medical faculty here for, what, 60 years or so? So. Um, uh, but uh, let me answer the Medicare question and then finish on the, the other point. Um, there's no doubt that you know, their the Medicare program is challenged, 
we lengthen the life of Medicare by eight years with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and uh, we have to do more. Um, the question wasn't, wasn't ever whether we don't, uh, don't need to do something to deal with uh, the challenges facing Medicare in, a, in, a, in an aging uh, population. And within, uh, the, the question is how? And uh, whether you know, a voucher system which slowly shifted costs onto uh, the beneficiaries, uh, ultimately in a crushing way, was the answer, or whether we need to reform uh, uh, the system and save money within the system. And that's what we have to have the, 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 the determination to do. Um, I'm sure there'll be discussion about other, uh, uh, you know, other things that may, may have to get done. But fundamentally, we need to, we need to uh, uh, as they say in Washington, bend the cost curve. We need to make uh, medicine um, uh, more efficient. Uh, Do you think there's any chance of, of getting to an agreement on, on any part of that this, this first year in the second term with the new Congress? Well, and, uh, look, part of this has to do with um, uh, seeing the Affordable Care Act through, and I think that took a great step forward on November 6th. I think we're going to see it through, and it's going to produce real results in terms of, and we've already seen results in terms of cost containment, but I think we'll see much more. Um, in terms of the rest of it, we'll see. I, I think uh, that uh, everybody said we, we have to have a, a, uh, an honest discussion and without limitation, and uh, I think that that discussion will go forward. But let me, uh, let me just address the epilepsy piece. Um, some of you may know that I have a child uh, our daughter Lauren, 31 years old now, and when she was seven months old, uh, Susan found her blue and limp in her crib and had thought she had passed away. And it turned out that she had had a seizure. We took her to the hospital. Susan took her to the hospital. I met them there. We saw her have another most frightening thing that I had ever seen, this tiny little baby having a, um, a, a grand mal seizure. And they told us then that it would maybe uh, that it was a febrile thing that the fever induced and that she would be better probably in, uh, in the next day or two days later. And we left the hospital a month later and she was still having you know, up to 10 seizures a day. And this went on for 18 years of her life, um, off and on, these, these flurries of seizures that we couldn't stop. They did tremendous damage to her, uh, robbed her of her uh, uh, childhood, robbed her of many of her capacities, almost of her life, and it kills 50,000 people a year. And so Susan, 13 years ago, started something called Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy uh, to help find the cure so no other families and other children wouldn't have to go through um, uh, what we saw our daughter go through or lose uh, their kids, as we saw many parents uh, do. And, um, uh, and so, uh, fast forward to the mustache. Uh, I, I made a bet on uh, television with Joe Scarborough that if we lost either Pennsylvania, Michigan, or uh, Minnesota, that I, uh, I would shave my mustache off. But that, and he agreed that he would grow one if we won Florida and North Carolina. And uh, of course, I won the bet. Uh, and Joe negotiated his way out of the bet by saying, "I'll give you ten thousand dollars for cure." They've been great supporters of ours, Joe and Mika, and we'll do a fundraiser for you. And I'll wear a, a fake mustache of your choosing at that fundraiser. Uh, we then expanded on that and said if we could raise a million dollars by uh, the end of this month for epilepsy research, for cure, that I would still shave my mustache off on Morning Joe. And uh, this is the final week. Uh, we're, we, we think we've raised close to $900,000. Uh, but there's still time. So anybody who wants to log on to slashthestash.com <laughs> Uh, can contribute to this. Well, I, I know I speak on behalf of everybody here when I say we look forward to seeing much more of you on campus, stash or no. We hope to see you without that stash because we're all curious <laughs> thank and want to see you reach that goal. And thank you. Thanks so much for this and for so everything. Thank at the you, Institute. and I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I think this is going to be an extraordinary institute. I think the students are going to benefit from it, the community will benefit from it, and we're going to make the University of Chicago a real destination for, um, for, for newsmakers, for, for practitioners, 
uh, in politics. Um, it, I think it'll be a great addition to what is already a great, great, uh, great institution. David, thanks so much for this. Thank, Thank you all for your question tonight. Thank you.